questions? <laughs> yeah, we go. Yeah, it's something <clears throat> a bit linking uh, Paolo and Lisa's talk, and also connecting to my own research, which I think uh, I think both uh, highlight uh, a bit the importance of the moments of choice uh, in historical uh, processes. Because while well, taking Lisa's talk, when you were uh, talking about the shortcomings of uh, transforming uh, books into uh, data, uh, I think it's uh, a bit like uh, what we were talking uh, before about when uh, all the drafts in a policy documents are uh, deleted. Uh, because if you just have access to the end product, which is the date of the book or the final draft of a policy document, but you don't see all that is uh, behind it, uh, you are just uh, taking for granted that uh, the text or the final version is a bit like uh, it is, and you just uh, forget what well, the importance, as you were saying, of uh, putting illustrations uh, in a book or uh, publicity or doing things uh, beyond the text and, and also of all the editing of uh, a draft uh, document until the final version. And I think um, uh, also, in Paolo's talk about uh, accounting, there's a bit of that, because if we take accounting as a, just a material representation of, of financial facts, which is as it is practiced now within the exact sciences, and we don't see accounting as something like founders on a belief system, and we don't see like the intentions uh, which are behind uh, keeping order of numbers, of figures, uh, etc., we, we are also just uh, losing all, all that kind of uh, value systems and, and just uh, pretending that a, a current account book is just a, a, a mimetic uh, representation of uh, financial facts without forgetting with it, what is behind that. So, so yeah, all the processes that are behind the documents. Yeah, I can comment on this very, very quickly. Uh, I have another presentation which is uh, on how finance always beyond finance. Uh, so every time that, and the Jesuits, for instance, knew this very well, so they, they had also some material techniques to avoid that when you read the accounting books, you think it's just about money. So for instance, the cash had two keys, and, and these keys were kept by people with different interests to make sure that the, what that account was about was always questioned. And then um, the other thing is what Angie Alford, uh, who is um, the founder of an uh, important accounting journal, said once, accounting has a tendency to become what it was not. So you think it's about finance, but then you discover it's something else, it's something else, it's something else. It's always something else. Uh, so if you keep that open, you enrich the knowledge of the quantities rather than uh, the other way around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Algorithms are working hard and seeing some people don't understand what's happening in the material. And I think that, that this is one of the. I don't want to sound like I'm saying that one is be books are better than digital data or, or vice versa or anything like that. It's different. But I think we understand how we engage with printed objects and doing it for very long time. And I think when a book is digitized, we have less. We don't really understand what choices have been made in that digitization process and how we're accessing it quite often. Which is why scholars then. Don't realize that there are obviously art problems and, and mistakes and so we know so very little about the process yet and how we're actually the choices that are being made on our behalf that maybe archive us from making printed material. And so I think it links into what to Claire's presentation as well. I guess with that it's kind of we've always just dealt with what we had. With, <coughs> I mean I think you said this before, we dealt with what we had in archives, in you know, the books that survived, the archives that survived. And we don't know what's happened in that case to know what's been lost. You know, if we knew what had happened, we could see what's been lost. That would help us. And I suppose if you know the rules that are going on behind the scenes to provide you with the data, it gives you more power. And I guess uh, just quick follow-up, uh, Claire. Uh, this uh, lengthy negotiation process you mentioned you need to do with the historians in the uh, trading consequence process, I guess part of that negotiation is what the algorithms uh, are mm. gonna are gonna do? Uh, you, you need. Well, we had to explain to them how the stuff we were gonna do was gonna work, but they also needed to explain to us how they did their research. We just we we do research.
research in a different way. And they did their research in a certain way, and we just didn't understand what they wanted the end product to be. So we had to spend a long time kind of trying to get under their skin and, and see what they do day to day, how they publish their stuff. How you publish is so different from computer science and <laughs> history. It's just, and you need to grasp those things in order to build a tool. So it's, it's not one way, it's completely mm -hmm. both ways. So what you've got so because there are two different start fields of thought, like you come from science background and they come from the science background. So how do you be in between when you establish the system then? It was just spending a lot of time together. What what was the, the anchor? The anchor was the mining. <laughs> 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 we, we had a project of working together. And it was it was groups who had worked together before on different projects. Um, but new members of staff working together. And it was the desire to for the computer scientists, the desire to, the desire to work with big amounts of data mm -hmm. and use it for something really useful and help people do their work. And for the environmental historians, it was access to tools that they wouldn't necessarily have before. And so it was just spending time together to, mm -hmm. to then... So what are the common goals then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jacob, one? No, I think there's an interesting from a historian perspective is that, that if you see that there's an interaction between the documents and the historian usually is the historian go to uh, and to how interpret what, from, what come from the document. But the, the hyperlink thing is just in the, the, the links of uh, 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 tools like this give a suggestion for the research. Just link to someone else and then the historian is kind of driven from the program, not by his uh, ears. I don't know. And then I also was thinking about the actual history could be kind of open source history about wiki search, you they can all add something and it be kind of uh, put in discussion group of the historian. And even the, the uh, you see the uh, monopoly on the knowledge because it's open source, so they can all write, but it's just kind of different. But that's the thing. The thing is, that this is interaction. The program, the tool, the software can suggest and drive the research. There's something new. I remember you had a question earlier for Paolo. Um, let's go to Anna first, and if you want to ask that, you can. Yeah, just to quickly follow up on what you just also said about the, these archives and the question of, um, I mean, we know that archives are always selections and so on, but I think that the problem that you point to with the OCR problem is that we actually think that the stuff we are using can can do more than it actually can. So we are basically deceived by the technology. We think that it is a full text search of everything, and it's not. Whereas we know that maybe the library of our university just has the books that it has. Nobody would think that these are all the books in the world. We know that. But in that case, we are deceived because we think, oh, it's full text search. Come on, you know, now I can really literally search everything that I can. And that's really, I think, the tricky part of it. Yeah. It's, it's like deceivable. <laughs> and if I can just step in there, I mean, if we look at the, I think it was Chloe who had the image earlier of the text that you were trying to read. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, really illegible. And then if we think of Paolo's um, accounting practices and how they're interwoven with a particular discourse of religion that is just not so anymore, and we think about legibility and interpretation and context and meaning and how they vary so much for the historians, you know, for historians, then actually how new is Claire's problem of trying to understand the text? I think the message for me is, you know, you take away, you, you cannot take away the social, the people, the interpreter from, from this process. And yeah, I, I think that's what I take away from that. Um, any other And kind of points? what we were yeah. trying to say as well is, it's not just having the interpreter at the end of it. They, and the person who's going to interpret it needs to collaborate on building so yeah. people need to get, you know, people do need to get involved with the community plan and just build something. Yeah. So the like it won't be what we expect to do or what we do. Did you gain any insights into like history and how history is done? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different from what you Really, thought. really different. So, um, with a computer scientist you need to know lots of stuff about lots of stuff. With historians 
you know a lot of stuff about a single thing and in great detail and you become the work authority and all of that. It was really interesting to, to see the way they did their work as well. So it's the way people went to the archives and these things. It's just really interesting. Yeah. Are you tempted to be a historian? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for the questions? Got a couple of them. Okay, well, I think